Uh, in today's lecture, we will be looking at uh, another important aspect of uh, material synthesis, which is uh, grouped under the uh, title crystal growth. Uh, it is uh, very difficult uh, to justify the domain where crystal growth technique stands, because it involves both solution chemistry or material synthesis via wet route. At the same time, the crystalline nature or the single crystalline features that emerges out of this crystal growth technique puts it in a different perspective. So, I have tried to discuss about the issues of crystal growth uh, in accordance with the thin films and the single crystals that we have seen in the previous lectures in module 2. We have already seen mo molecular beam epitaxy which is a very refined physical vapor deposition technique where single crystalline materials can be made with the different components. It can be binary, ternary or quaternary uh, <coughs> metals, uh, but in uh, today's lecture I will give you a glimpse of how this crystal growth can be extended not only from looking at it as a mere solution process, but also in terms of application we can see how this can become an indispensable technique. Therefore, I have uh, <coughs> chosen a few examples to highlight to you uh, the basic issues that are involved in crystal growth and the fundamentals that we need to have in mind. And in the laboratory practices we have always encountered recrystallization which is a very simple protocol but we can actually go to a more cumbersome and a more involved crystal growth technique uh, which is more expensive from the uh, industrial point of view but then <coughs> we will uh, we have to uh, have a glimpse of both extremes from a uh, lab scale synthesis to a industry scale so in the next few slides i will talk to you about the basics of crystal growth and then take you through some examples of uh, the different materials that we can prepare in different dimensions. Crystal growth as we see these are all the optical images of various crystals grown uh, from different materials and each one is a class uh, in itself. Uh, they all order themselves in a particular uh, way and they grow three dimensionally, but then the facets if you look at the projections this particular crystal grows in a particular axis and this particular crystal grows in a different axis and the shape and size of each crystal talks about the growth pattern that is involved. So, uh, <coughs> although uh, uh, growing crystal is uh, very very intricate, but yet it is fundamental to understanding uh, the materials chemistry. Therefore, we will look at various aspects of crystal growth. Uh, for reviews, we have uh, several websites and uh, powerpoints from other uh, groups worldwide where people have discussed about crystal growth in greater detail, but I will try to give you a comprehensive picture on what are all the important techniques that are available. In the first place, we can ask some question why we need to prepare single crystals. As you can see here, a uh, single crystal can transcend uh, to different applications um, diamond, ruby and sapphire. Uh, not only they are gemstones, but they are also extended to use in as laser materials. Single crystals are not just used for cosmetic uses, but also they find applications in uh, electronic devices. Uh, one of the very important uh, application of single crystal growth is in silicon industry. We will come to this shortly from now. So, you can see silicon chips are um, actually uh, <coughs> fabricated uh, using uh, the crystal growth technique and uh, lasers um, in today's chemistry is mainly pioneered by single crystal growth. This is a, a map of how silicon industry is flourishing today and it is a never dying industry and uh, hundreds of applications have been engineered through silicon uh, technology and as you can see here this is one of the view graph of how uh, silicon can be used to make uh, devices 
and uh, the basic material that we can start is with the wafer and uh, there are different grades of uh, silicon that we can grow. We can grow as wafers, as uh, uh, single crystals uh, with the three dimensions or you can try to coat it in two dimension. Uh, therefore, we, we can talk about uh, silicon crystal which is oriented single crystalline uh, polycrystalline silicon and this is the way uh, most of the uh, devices are made with uh, base material such as a silicon wafer and uh, uh, typically the sizes that we can achieve out of this silicon wafers are 6 inch 12 inch wafers. So, technology is now ripe to make such very large wafers and if you recall this set of wafers are the ones which really turn out to, to be photovoltaic cells. So, today's photovoltaic cells are mostly driven by uh, silicon industry and this big silicon cr single crystals can be made using vacuum technology. Now, uh, let us go through some definitions and uh, some classification before we go into specific example. From a lab point of view or for a chemist, there are few things that he needs to uh, bear in mind when he thinks about making a crystal. So, five, five main methods that can put uh, most of the organic and inorganic materials into perspective. One is cooling method where you take a super saturated solution and then try to cool, then you can get this evaporation technique is one, uh, cooling technique is another one and then we can think of vapor diff diffusion method, liquid liquid diffusion and uh, sublimation. Most of these processes are encountered in every day's lab practices. Therefore, we have in some form have stumbled at one of this technique at some point of time. So, we are not alien to the single crystal growth, certainly we have used it in some form, but this is not enough to transcend to applications. We can merely be confined only to solving crystal structure if we resort to only this sort of uh, simple techniques. So, we will see much more involved techniques in the uh, future slides. Uh, some uh, crystal growth tips are given uh, taken from uh, Jersey who has uh, put it in a very nice way. Uh, <clears throat> the general thoughts are growing crystals is a skill. We should not think this is a, a surmountable task, actually it is an art. So, if you have a feel for uh, growing crystal, it, it is uh, most likely that you will end up with very beautiful uh, crystals and uh, we need to be persistent because crystal uh, isolation is not a easy task, but at the same time we need to understand some of the fundamentals to making this crystal. So, we need to be persi persistent, we need to be observant because sometimes you may be hoping for big crystals end up with a small crystal, sometimes you do not get crystal, it will amorphous it will um, uh, it will become an amorphous uh, precipitate set and it might sediment. So, in such case you got to be careful to understand what exactly is happening and uh, we should also know that purer the compound uh, that you start with then good crystals you can get. So, um, <coughs> these are some of the issues that we need to think especially when you are playing with the uh, solution route. This is the most uh, popular crystal growth route that any organic or inorganic chemist would go for. And this is a crystal growth using a controlled cooling uh, where you take a, a supernatant solution and then you start cooling a, in a very systematic way. You do not go for abrupt cooling, but then you do it in a phased way, then you can see crystals are coming out of a saturated solution. So, the solubility of most compounds decreases as the temperature is lowered, thus cooling of a saturated solution often produces crystals. So, this is one way and uh, to make sure that this is a very gradual process, you try to encapsulate this uh, uh, test tube and then try to allow this to go through a very phased and systematic cooling, no abrupt cooling. And uh, for those who are involved in organic synthesis, usually you can try to recrystallize and then put it in a fridge, even sudden cooling can bring out beautiful crystals, but these are not the sort of recrystallization that I am talking about. These are uh, intentionally to grow crystals and so therefore, this is one way that we can 
uh, achieve. Another way to achieve uh, crystals is to reduce the concentration in order to get the crystals out. Uh, so, what you do here is carefully try to evaporate the solvent and so that you can concentrate the solution. Otherwise, the crystals are actually soluble. So, you try to exploit the solubility of your system uh, in a given solvent and usually you use this apparatus to uh, preferably uh, eliminate one or more solvents and uh, using this apparatus and this way you can try to concentrate the solution and once you concentrate to a particular volume then you can get the crystals uh, down. So, this is another way of doing and uh, another approach which is very familiar in organic or inorganic practice is to take two different uh, solutions and they are actually not miscible therefore, they would form a layer immiscible layer and at the interface you would actually see the crystals forming and uh, which we call it as anti solvent one is anti solvent therefore, there is a layer formed. Uh, the other way of uh, doing that the, the solvent diffusion is to take a solution and then put it in another solution and then cover it you can make small uh, orifice here or small holes. So, that this anti solvent can diffuse into this one and based on this interface um, <coughs> reactions you will get the crystals coming out. So, this is another way uh, which is actually a slow process compared to uh, this process, but you can definitely get crystals at the interface. Uh, so, this is called solvent diffusion uh, reactions and another one which is almost a common protocol in uh, any uh, chemi chemistry lab practice is sublimation, where you try to take sample and then you try to heat it in vacuum then in the cooler you can actually have a cooling hand where this is actually chilled. So, in the cooler part of the uh, setup you get you see this uh, crystals uh, uh, crystallizing or depositing. So, this can be uh, very good uh, and the most inexpensive way of isolating crystals and there are other refinements to this approach in the form of this where you try to take the sample with your solution and then you heat it and you keep this. Uh, arm of the uh, design cooled and you can see that the crystals are actually segregating out in this uh, fashion. So, there are different ways that we can try to enforce a crystallization process using a solution uh, approach. Now, why we need uh, solution growth? Uh, because you can grow congruently and incongruently by melting materials. You, we need very simple equipment. Therefore, uh, in any chemistry lab practice you will see almost every other compound that is prepared is go uh, taken through a crystallization uh, process just to refine it and uh, simple equipment is what we need and uh, uh, growth time scale is also very low uh, or very short and you need very small amount of materials you do not have to run a batch process therefore, it has its own advantage only thing in these crystals you can probably isolate dimensions worth for single crystal x-ray studies, but not for other applications. Therefore, this is one of the limitations of a solution uh, process. So, when we are talking about solution growth, um, I want to emphasize that in module 1, I had discussed in greater detail on the relevance of hydrothermal, where you take it in an autoclave, you put some pressure, high pressure to it you can actually crystallize it uh, using a mineralizer uh, any um, oxide or any other compounds can be crystallized and uh, crystals of a preferred dimension can also be isolated which I have already discussed in module 1. And uh, these are the other techniques which are usually practiced in everyday uh, practices in a chemistry lab. So, I am not going to discuss in detail on these issues which uh, can be covered. Uh, Sol gel route also I have mentioned in module 1, but we will go into other approaches where we can try to get more uh, insight into it. So, apart from solution growth uh, that we have seen so far, uh, the other important way of uh, realizing crystal growth is through vapor phase growth. And in vapor phase growth uh, in module 2, 
I have already discussed with you about this most sophisticated uh, vapor phase technique which is molecular beam epitaxy and I have also mentioned to you about general uh, uh, vapor evaporation or chemical vapor deposition techniques or vapor phase epitaxy all this I have discussed in the previous lectures therefore we will not look into this vapor phase growth either. So, uh, in today's uh, <coughs> talk uh, mainly we will look at some of the solid state growth or we will look at some examples of melt growth techniques. So, in perspective when you think about uh, crystal growth you need to understand there are several ways uh, and the magnitude of each effort varies and the simplest of it of course is the, is the most orthodox chemical route that we call it as solution route. So, uh, let us go a uh, little bit more and try to see what are all the uh, different facets of melt growth and solid state growth techniques. Uh, as I have already told you uh, these are the different uh, categories of solution growth technique. Um, so, so, I, I do not want to go through this uh, list again and then there are several modifications to this uh, uh, solution growth technique. You can do that even with a magnetic field and you can try to uh, bring about a, a pressure control all this are uh, different facets to uh, the solution growth technique and uh, vapor phase growth method as I have told you is chemical vapor phase or molecular beam epitaxy. So, this again I will try to skip and take you more into the details of melt growth uh, technique. So, this is nothing but growth from liquid phase and it involves a two stage phase transition. One is you start with solid and then end up with a liquid and then again you grow a solid. So, this is a, a two step phase transition solid to liquid, liquid to solid which we call it as a melt growth and in this uh, two or three popular methods are there and historically they are at least 30 to 40 years old and we have never uh, we have never found any other alternate route other than improvising on this good old techniques and th what are they one is Bridgman technique and the other one is Zeralski technique and uh, uh, same to do with that a uh, closely related is uh, uh, Cairo Paulus uh, technique and then another different one is Vernoil's uh, technique uh, and these are uh, closely related to Vernoil's method. So, we can take actually few examples to identify what these techniques are and what are the minimum requirements for it. Um, issues that we need to understand here is uh, there is a phase transition liquid to solid and then we need to have a precise control of temperature and uh, the gra uh, temperature gradients as we grow these crystals and uh, we may have to hit at very high melting point because you are taking a solid to a liquid state and then again transforming it therefore you need a way to melt the solids usually inorganic solids are having very high temperature therefore you bring in uh, additional uh, requirements such as uh, heating methods uh, before you uh, optimize on the cooling issues and then another important issue is that when you are actually taking from a solid to liquid you need a container which will not react with your material and therefore the reactivity of the crucible becomes or the crucible design material issues become a very crucial point and then the control nucleation um, all this become important. So, in melt growth technique we will be looking at uh, zone melting which is one of a very popular uh, route and uh, another one is crystal pulling. So, you actually try to initiate a crystal growth using a pulling technique it can be it can either be uh, initiated in a horizontal way or you can pull the uh, uh, growing crystal uh, in a top way, but in nevertheless you need to actually start with a seed crystal and that seed crystal will initiate a uh, larger crystal growth. So, uh, in all these techniques you actually initiate the nucleation process and from that uh, front it will start gr growing in a periodic way. So, uh, these two are more 
uh, involved because it is very ramp uh, it, it is a time consuming process. But flame fusion which is Vernoil's method is a rapid growth method you just melt all the stuff and then you immediately cool it this is quite different from the zone and uh, crystal pool technique. Okay. In melt growth method uh, the most important one is uh, Bridgman technique and this has different way of realizing it. So, you can actually go, go for a vertical Bridgman technique or you can go for a horizontal boat uh, Bridgman technique. So, the assembly of your uh, technique actually matters, but by and large uh, the uh, principle of Bridgman technique remains the same. Uh, we can also have uh, the other uh, one that is um, zone melting technique can either be in horizontal uh, mode or it can be in a vertical mode. We will come to this uh, schematically then we can understand uh, what exactly we mean by that. And then uh, we have pulling techniques which is usually Zeralski method and then uh, floating zone methods are there we will look at this uh, one by one. So, the basic methods that we are talking about is uh, Zeralski method, Bridgman method, floating zone method and uh, we also have other methods uh, which are a combination of two uh, we will shortly see from there. What is this Zeralski method? Uh, this is a most industrially used method uh, because you can get um, very high quality uh, crystals especially for silicon and basically this uh, Zeralski method is even till now it is a sustained process because the use of silicon is very important. Therefore, this is one of the established way to grow that crystal and you can see uh, if you have a feed you can realize single crystal uh, successfully for three fourth of the batch that you are feeding. Therefore, you, you do not lose on the starting material because uh, the silicon powder itself uh, to get it is very costly. Therefore, to grow a crystal where half of it becomes waste cannot be a viable process. But Zeralski method you, you can actually translate three fourth of the feed that you are giving uh, during me melting can be realized as a single crystal. Therefore, this is a very popular uh, method and uh, the design of a Zeralski method is like this. You have uh, the feed which is actually uh, transformed into a melt using um, a heater and this heater can be a resistance uh, involved or it can be radio frequency involved heating. So, you can actually see uh, how the whole growth process uh, through this viewport and what you do here is that you have a pulling machine and this rod is actually suspended with a seed here and this is actually kept here at, uh, at the beginning uh, at the start of the process where the seed crystal is touching the melt and then you can keep on rotating this in a fashion that it will actually grow into a larger crystal. So, this is actually pulling from bottom up and what are the requirements you need uh, the melt is actually contained in quartz or in silicon nitrate crucible because otherwise it will react and then the, it has to be confined in a chamber therefore, the whole thing is kept in a um, atmosphere of argon and what we need to achieve is uh, the silicon which is the feed has to be melted the uh, melting temperature is of the order of 1400 uh, degree C. Therefore, uh, the whole assembly has to withstand such high temperatures and then you can realize such uh, uh, single crystals and uh, the other parameters in Zeralski synthesis is the growth speed. Typically, you would not see the rotator moving because it is actually making a RPM very slow. So, to our naked eye you would not even see anything moving because you are actually going through 1 to 2 millimeters per minute. Therefore, it is a very very slow process and it might take even days to grow uh, almost a half a feet la long crystal. So, uh, crucible introduces uh, oxygen contamination which is a problem which is often combated and then feed material form is unconstrained and then heat up and cool down times are long and uh, usually we uh, we worry about the assembly which has to be made to withstand such temperature 
and niobium and the construction of this uh, uh, whole system becomes a issue. Uh, Zeralski method can also be uh, modified and this is one such system where you can see this is they use a tri arc furnace to quickly melt the feed and uh, melting is accomplished by three arcs then you can actually do a rotating water cooled uh, copper crucible and uh, we can uh, do this in a vacuum we can uh, achieve up to 3000 degree C using this sort of uh, tri arc furnace. Uh, the next one is actually a Bridgman technique and in Bridgman technique we can try to mount your crucible or your feed it can be lo loaded in a horizontal way or we can have it in a vertical way and mainly we use a crucible for this uh, pulling technique. Um, you also require a seed crystal in this Bridgman technique and this is uh, a process where you actually have a direct solidification uh, because we are talking about liquid to solid and uh, th in this pulling technique you are actually pulling it with a temperature gradient so that this will uh, become a solid. So, what is required here in this pulling technique is that you need a precise temperature gradient and uh, this is the way uh, a Bridgman technique is uh, <coughs> realize you have uh, a heater which will actually melt your feet and therefore what you see here is a molten uh, substance of uh, <clears throat> any material that you want to grow as a crystal and you actually pull it in one uh, direction and uh, this is actually kept in a furnace and this furnace can actually be divided into different zones different zones therefore you need to keep this area in one uh, temperature gradient and this one in another temperature gradient and this one. So, you need a very gradual temperature gradient like this. So, that as you come, uh, come out you will be able to uh, grow a defect free one. Suppose you just pull it out which you call it as quenching then there will be lot of imperfections in the crystal that is grown because definitely it will solidify when you pull a melt, but that is not the way you grow a crystal. So, this is a technique by itself which is very costly although it looks simple, but you, what you see here you can grow very large crystals uh, to the dimension of crucible and uh, volume of your melt. Therefore, this is a very uh, a good technique compared to even Zeralski and uh, much more easier. All you need to optimize is this pulling time has to be optimized and the temperature gradient has to be standardized and typical uh, position versus temperature uh, is uh, curve for a Bridgman technique is like this where initially you can pull it fast, but then when you try to uh, uh, solidify it when you try to form the crystal you should actually go through a plateau which is uh, much more um, slower. Therefore, you need to go through a temperature uh, gradient like this before you realize uh, your crystal. So, this is the uh, type of uh, uh, profile uh, or the uh, temperature po uh, position graph that you should optimize for your Bridgman technique. Uh, what you can achieve here is that uh, <coughs> crystals of dimension uh, 10 to 40 millimeter uh, can be realized and uh, it requires only tip of a seed to be molten which means a very small tip is needed so that on that it can start growing and you can also reach up to 200 millimeter for silicon and gallium arsenide crystals and this again is actually kept in a um, inert atmosphere. And uh, some of the other issues uh, from the economy point of view you cannot keep on using the same one therefore, uh, it becomes a bit more expensive on those lines. Uh, one of the uh, well known compound that is lithium neobate it is a optical material um, lithium neobate it is a perovskite and uh, doped with uh, uh, neodymium lanthanum ion uh, lanthanide ion this can actually be a filter for your india glazes um, and uh, how to prepare this you can take lithium neobate and we can try to uh, melt it and then cool this uh, stuff. Uh, this is actually a vertical process. What you do here, uh, the feed is kept here 
and we can try to use the seed crystal to keep pulling it, but this is also kept in a um, in a surrounding which is packed with alumina because the, there will be a temperature gradient if you are directly exposing this to a heater. So, in order to avoid a temperature gradient uh, in a drastic way, you try to pack this whole assembly in a alumina matrix so that it is a isothermal effect. The, there will be uniform distribution of this temperature throughout. Otherwise, there will be a uh, very serious uh, temperature gradient and this is the assembly and you can see here the x-ray pattern of the lithium niobate that is grown. Uh, this is the feed material which is the bulk before it is melted and then the as grown crystal both shows a very clear match in the x-ray pattern and uh, lithium niobate which is doped with neodymium as I told you is a very good uh, uh, material optical material and shows uh, PL uh, at around uh, 1200 nanometers. If you look at the purity of the uh, crystals that we get you can see a very good agreement between the feed material and the obtained crystal. You can see here not much of change in the lithium content, niobium content has a slightly larger uh, mismatch, but uh, lithium to neodymium ratio is uh, absolutely uh, in an agreeable limit. So, um, this is a very, very uh, important and uh, the uh, most preferred uh, route for ferroelectric crystals. Therefore, Bridgman technique is still being used for growing ferroelectrics. The next technique is uh, floating zone technique and uh, here floating zone uh, means you try to bring out a, a zone which will divide between the feed and the crystal and the intermediate necking region is actually melted. Uh, so, how do you melt that? You can use a radio frequency to melt that region or you can use a electron beam to melt that region. Therefore, it is called E B floating zone uh, method and actually uh, we can make uh, several uh, alloys or metals using floating zone uh, to mention uh, niobium, tantalum, molybdenum, rhenium, tungsten. Uh, the reason why uh, floating zone method is very popular is all these alloys or metals which are mentioned here they are having very very high melting points above 2500 degree C. Therefore, it is very difficult to use other methods um, <coughs> what I have discussed. Uh, so, uh, E beam uh, uh, floating zone method is still the most preferred one for simple metals like uh, uh, molybdenum, rhenium and tungsten and uh, there are several issues that are related to that. Uh, one uh, important thing that you should understand between the Bridgman and Zeralski method and this is here you do not need a, a crucible. So, you just have a, a feed and then you have the seed and in between the feed and the seed you create a, a zone and that will actually melt and start growing as a um, crystal. So, growth rates of uh, 50 millimeter per minute can also be realized therefore, these are comparatively a fast crystal growing technique compared to uh, Bridgman method. Uh, this is the typical assembly for this uh, E B floating zone where you can see here uh, the tungsten filament cathode is there. This is the melt uh, stock which is nothing but your anode. So, this has to be conducting uh, in order to make this as an anode. So, this is your feed what we uh, call and this is your seed. Uh, with the interface and in between you can see the liquid melt which is actually um, melted using uh, a filament, uh, but in order to focus it only on this region otherwise the whole feed can melt. So, in order to do that you also introduce some optics here which we call it as focusing electrodes. So, you try to bring such a way that the focus is only on a very small interface. So, that we call it as a floating zone. So, uh, it will not actually melt the growing seed, neither it will melt the feed uh, uh, fully, it will only concentrate on a very small region. Therefore, the there are different ways that you can realize such a preferential uh, melting. So, in E B floating zone, um, 
you can get um, crystals of diameter un, uh, up to 100 millimeter and then um, one problem that we face here is uh, the penetration. Uh, it is not possible to actually run through the bulk uh, especially when you have a feed um, in EB what happens the, the surface melts but then it does not really go into the bulk therefore there are some practical problems which needs to be uh, sorted out when we go for this floating zone method. Uh, here is another picture of a floating zone uh, apparatus where you are actually using a RF coil to uh, melt this uh, interface and here again you can see uh, the single crystal can, uh, can be grown into a bigger dimension and that is one of the advantage of using a uh, floating zone method. Uh, typically um, you can realize such sophisticated uh, instruments for uh, for floating zone these are commercially available. So, uh, this is a, an industry in itself where um, such apparatus refined ones are already commercially available. So, we can go for um, such expensive uh, techniques also. Now, to bring about a proper melting at the interface there are different arrangements that are possible one is called two mirror a halogen lamp furnace you can also have a four mirror hal halogen lamp furnace and the whole idea in this floating zone technique is to make sure that it is really melting the uh, zone in a very very uh, precise way without uh, creating any uh, temperature gradient over a uh, large area. So, a uh, lot of refinement has come into picture in this floating zone technique. Uh, <coughs> how do we go about this floating zone? Uh, simply we can start with uh, an example uh, roughly what you would need is about 20 gram of a powder mm. you can uh, if it is a titanate you do not have to uh, worry about it you can take the raw powder as it is uh, in case of manganites you need to actually anneal it little bit mainly because manganites uh, take uh, carbon dioxide or water it, since it is reactive you need to um, activate the surface therefore, if you are going to grow a manganate crystal you may have to do a annealing before you take it or you may have to partially anneal it for vanadates. So, this is just to uh, prepare your sample and how do you go about it you actually fill it in a rubber tube you can even do it in a balloon and you can stack this 20 gram in a balloon and tie it in this fashion and you can tie this uh, ends and you can put this in a isostatic press. Isostatic press is nothing but uh, you put it in a uh, container with uh, oil and then you apply pressure from all sides. Then what happens this uh, stuff which is, uh, which is contained in the balloon or rubber will actually become a rod by itself. In other words, if you start with a compaction or a green density, green density of say a 40 percent that means you just tapped it and uh, took away all the air sacs uh, in between then using isostatic pressing you should be able to uh, get up to six, uh, 60 or 70 percent uh, density and that will be a very good feed for your floating zone method. So, what you do? after isostatic pressing you can try to remove this uh, rubber or you can uh, tear off the balloon then you get a rod which is nothing but a simple compact but good enough to hold it as a rod and then you try to put that as your feed here and then we can so this is nothing but the dimension of what I have shown in the previous slide. So, this we can use it for using as a feed in order to grow the seed. So, this feed is actually mounted and we can start melting it in this uh, interface or in the necking region then we can try to grow the uh, crystal and this particular cartoon gives you a real time image of how this growth process occurs. You can see this is your feed and then how the necking region is here and then uh, the seed crystal is actually growing. 
Um, in, there are different conditions that are required uh, when you are growing different materials. For example, for titanate you have a preferred uh, choice, 95% uh, argon and 5% uh, hydrogen is needed. In case of manganese because it is uh, oxide with uh, different valency of manganese you got to be uh, careful therefore, you need to have a mixture of air and uh, uh, more amount of oxygen to it and uh, similarly uh, other uh, rare earth manganese can be used. What you can see here uh, uh, is this uh, the amount of sintering that has also to be accompanied with this sort of uh, floating zone method for titanates you can achieve up to 80 percent of growth and uh, uh, again manganate 80 percent then we can look for uh, venerate uh, 60 percent. So, the compaction melting all these are very crucial for different uh, uh, oxides that we are using and usually we try to standardize this by uh, trial and error method. Uh, typically the growth uh, process also involves the way you try to grow it the, in terms of growth rate. Uh, manganates are much more faster, we can try to grow at a much uh, faster speed, but uh, titanates are usually uh, a time consuming one. Uh, the sort of rods that we can grow, uh, single crystal manganates or venerates uh, typically looks like this. You can grow such long ones and then those are nearly 99.9 percent .9 dense. So, this sort of single crystal rods can be usually achieved using this floating zone method. Uh, this is another technique that stands out compared to uh, all the other uh, techniques that we have discussed. This is called Vernoil method and Vernoil method is a melt technique where you are actually going to feed alumina as a powder and you are going to send hydrogen oxygen flame and this hydrogen oxygen flame will actually melt this feed which is coming from here and at this point if you have a, a seed here this will nicely grow and what you are seeing here is nothing but a ruby crystal which is uh, Al2O3 doped with the chromium and uh, if you are going to grow ruby all you need to do is take some Cr2O3 or CrO3 whichever is possible and try to melt it along with the alumina in a desired quantity then you should be able to get a single crystalline uh, ruby crystal and uh, this is basically a melt process which is very different from the other uh, stuff because the melting is actually carried out by uh, a flame which is composed of hydrogen and oxygen which can actually hit flame temperatures up to 2200. Uh, so, it is more like a welding uh, protocol you, you try to use a very high uh, flame to melt the compound and grow the crystal. Uh, <coughs> ruby crystals actually can be made uh, using Vernoil's method, but we can also use another important technique which I will be discussing in the next few slides which is called as flux method. Okay. And uh, in this uh, cartoon you can see there are several flux that are mentioned and this is one of the very distinguished chemical technique by which we can prepare uh, single crystal rubies. Uh, you can see here lithium oxide molybdenum oxide mixture in 1 is to 2 mole ratio if you take and put it in a furnace uh, in a crucible uh, you can actually melt it between 1120 to 1140 degree C then this lithium oxide molybdenum oxide will form a melt and in this melt if you drop some alumina with the chromium oxide then what you will get is ultimately a ruby crystal in a melt and this lithium oxide molybdenum oxide is actually water soluble. Therefore, when the crystals are formed all you need to do is just dump it in a hot water then all these things gets dissolved into water and what is remaining as a residue is nothing but the crystals that are formed. So, this is a simple protocol of a flux method and this flux method is very very common in all solid state chemistry laboratories where you just need a oven not even 
uh, a furnace you just need a oven because most of the flux can be melted at 200 or 300 degrees C. So, this is a very very uh, easy way to realize single crystals of any compound only thing you do not get a control over the large size that you can grow, but in a lab scale you can get very oriented and good quality crystals for, uh, for even uh, a tricky uh, composition like ruby. So, uh, this is one way you can realize as you can see here depending on the flux ratio you can also try to affect the uh, uh, growth process and the shape of the ruby crystals. And uh, here is another one which is uh, usually used uh, lead oxide, vanadium oxide and tungsten oxide as a flux melt and if you have different compositions of these you can take uh, aluminum chro uh, chromium ratio you will be able to get different qualities or different varieties of uh, uh, single uh, ruby single crystals and uh, here you can see uh, all this uh, pictures of ruby crystal although they do not look like uh, uh, pink color the characteristic color uh, the surface is actually um, uh, contaminated with the coating of the melt. Now, once you polish this you will be able to get a real quality um, rubies and uh, depending on the melt you can see the shape and dimension of the crystals that you can isolate and you can also see this melt does not really affect the composition of your uh, ruby. Uh, it will be in trace amounts. So, one can use a variety of combination of uh, 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 flux for growing ruby crystals. Uh, in uh, For flux growth there are some essential things that we need to bear in mind. One is uh, the advantage is that you can have play around with very low melting uh, temperature because you are actually melting uh, a flux and that will actually bring about the melting temperature of your uh, target compound. So, you low down the melting temperature of the desired compound. We can also easily separate the melt from the product and uh, therefore, this has advantages. Uh, what are the needs or what we really need for a flux growth method? You need tubes and you need crucibles. Okay. Tubes in order to seal your uh, 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 material and then crucible because that is where you let the crystals grow. So, typically the container and tube choices are given here just I want to single out for example, uh, if I want to prepare uh, single crystals of iron, cobalt, nickel, ferromagnetic metals then I usually use a high temperature crucible like alumina or zirconia which does not react with any of these metals therefore, I can uh, get that. The assembly for making flux growth also can be as involved as this although you can even use a simple oven and here is one case where you can actually uh, arc melt the uh, flux because you immediately get it and then you certainly require a glass sealing station which means you need to achieve up to 10 power minus 6 tor atmosphere and once you achieve this then you should be able to seal this and this is typically the capsules that you get uh, before you go for uh, uh, flux growth. Uh, what you see here are the alumina crucibles which are the which is called as growth crucibles and then you have catch crucibles which are usually quartz. So, quartz is actually used for sealing the uh, crucible and inside the quartz you can actually have alumina crucibles with your material. So, <coughs> this is the way you do it and uh, typically you need furnace to grow this uh, flux grown crystals. So, uh, these are typical <coughs> dimensions of the furnaces that you need to have. You can actually use uh, high temperature furnaces uh, mostly molybdenum disilicide which can give you up to uh, 1700 degree C or you can use silicon carbide uh, furnaces which can achieve up to 1500. Now, one uh, of the uh, main advantage of flux grown method is to prepare photoluminescent gallium nitride materials which is actually published by this group and uh, just want to show you some glimpse of uh, how costly the gallium nitride is and uh, how we can achieve using um, a flux grown method. Gallium nitride as you know is uh, a well known 
uh, LED uh, light emitting diode and uh, typically this is also used in read write uh, laser diodes and uh, it, these are all very costly uh, products which are in market today and uh, to grow this gallium nitrate main problem is you do not have a gallium to nitrogen ratio which is 1 is to 1. Usually when you grow by other methods uh, including thin film methods the ratio of gallium to nitrate is always uh, different. So, you end up getting gallium uh, gallium uh, <coughs> nitrogen 1 minus x always. The nitrogen composition will be very critical to control and as a result it can actually induce lot of defects in your gallium nitride uh, diodes. <coughs> so, flux method can give you a very refined growth and as you see here this is a, a comparative slide which tells you uh, how important flux grown uh, flux uh, growth method can be. Uh, <coughs> these gallium nitride single crystals can be grown in a larger disc like this using <coughs> physical vapor deposition routes and uh, what you do here you take gallium chloride and uh, ammonia is passed as a wafer and you can try to deposit in a sapphire crystal and you can get dimensions of this order. Only thing when you grow as a thin film then the dislocation density is very high. So, in order to beat that you can actually go for a high pressure solution growth where you can uh, try to grow it uh, using liquid gallium and uh, nitrogen at high pressures. In such case you can realize um, very less uh, dislocation density which means the quality of the single crystal is very good only thing you get very uh, small dimensions of gallium nitrate crystals. Flux grown method is another easy route where you can achieve uh, comprehensively a larger uh, diameter with less defects and uh, how do you go about with the flux method gallium nitrate uh, we can grow with a liquid <coughs> sodium gallium uh, melt and uh, we can try to <coughs> also add lithium uh, and other um, uh, additives to enrich on the nitrogen content and this has a high potential to increase the growth rate even to 100 kilometers per hour. You can grow such uh, large uh, crystals at a faster rate. Uh, so, this is a typical profile of your pressure uh, temperature graph which is uh, required for achieving uh, gallium nitride uh, um, <coughs> uh, formation using flux growth and uh, typically the size of the uh, crystals can be as large as this. Um, so, this is achievable uh, if you, uh, you can get a gallium nitride of say 2 gram quantity if you are going to start with 40 grams of gallium and 600 grams of ammonia and hydrogen. So, uh, this is typically the, um, <coughs> the, the level in which you need to start in order to get a 2 gram quantity of gallium nitride. Um, main uh, issue as far as gallium nitride growth is concerned is the container in which you are growing because it should not uh, uh, diffuse or it should not react with your melt and in that case usually borates are used. So, any flux growth method all that you should remember is borates metal borates are the most important uh, ones which uh, which needs to be used. Therefore, most of these crucibles are very very expensive uh, zirconium bromide is one which is often used and there are several ways to improve on this gallium nitrate growth especially addition of carbon seems to uh, increase the solubility of car gallium nitride uh, in the melt. So, a uh, lot of improvisation can be achieved using this and uh, this is one view graph which tells what sort of growth that you achieve out of uh, gallium nitride typically gives the characteristic P L property for the flux grown um, crystals. And uh, I have to also mention that this although looks like a simple technique this is one of a billion dollar industry in today's uh, materials world. Uh, crystal growth can never be substituted with anything and therefore, there are several companies uh, across the globe which is uh, producing uh, <coughs> uh, several varieties of single crystals. Uh, I am not particularly inclined to promote this, but then uh, these are some of uh, the uh, 
companies uh, which are uh, found in the websites. Uh, for example, I am just quoting this particular company uh, just to highlight what sort of single crystals are being marketed. Almost you name any element in the periodic table, they seem to be uh, making a single crystal out of it. So, it is a big business used for uh, several uh, applications as monochromatous they use all sort of uh, methods that we have discussed for making a wide range of uh, compounds and uh, for sophisticated or for preferred single crystals like uh, sapphire or endiac uh, or for silicon wafers all this can also be uh, made and uh, there are several companies working or specializing on particular materials also. Uh, I should also say that uh, a single crystal growth is not uh, 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 just another one, it is a field in itself, it is a research field and uh, several publications are also floated in today's uh, uh, literature and just to show you how this uh, area has grown, uh, has bloomed into a major area, you can see several uh, <coughs> journals are also floated exclusively on crystal growth. So, just to uh, conclude, I have to tell you that we first looked at the principles of solution growth which we are already familiar with and then we looked at the vapor phase growth and uh, uh, notably the molecular beam epitaxy which stands out as the best single crystal growth method and then we also looked at some examples of solid state growth and lastly we have seen the various combinations of melt growth techniques which are used even today for making uh, fine quality single crystals.